Uh, I'm Richard Brown, the chairman of the OpenSUSE project and the technical lead in the SLE QA department inside SUSE. So I wear both hats. And I'm here to talk to you about that. I'm here to talk to you about how the open enterprise, SUSE being an open, open company, is working with OpenSUSE, the open community, to sort of you know, collaborate with each other, empower each other, and you know, what that actually means in very real terms. So to start, I'm going to talk a little bit about how, well, what the OpenSUSE project is. You know, click, you know, a little bit of history, a little bit of explanation of where it's coming from, what it's doing, and you know, looking back, especially to sort of 2014 and before, which and you know, and how things have changed since then. I'll be talking a little bit about Tumbleweed, a special a special part of the OpenSUSE project, and then I'll be talking about how OpenSUSE and Leap are co-developed and and developing together. And I'll be talking about Leap and the purpose that this OpenSUSE Leap serves in the, the sort of combined SUSE OpenSUSE ecosystem. So, talking about OpenSUSE, who's running OpenSUSE in some way, form, or another here? Cool, great. About half, but yeah, okay. So, it started as an open, SUSE pro as an open source project sponsored by SUSE uh, and was effectively the successor to the, the, the boxed sets that SUSE were selling at the time before they moved on to selling enterprise products. Um, so it's 2005, and, and the the goal, the yeah, the stated goal at the time was was promoting the use of Linux everywhere, uh, and yeah, they produced the main distribution. So that makes us you know 11 year old, and I always try and slip at least one cat photo into this slide deck. So there we are, um, and it started out as just the distribution, just the box set. That's where we were. But over time, things evolved, things developed, and very quickly, in fact, like OBS started a year later, it became a, an umbrella project for a, a huge collection of SUSE-aligned, and sometimes not even SUSE-aligned, open source projects, such as Tumbleweed, Wicked, Snapper, Yast, of course, Kiwi, OpenQA, et cetera. But obviously, the thing that most people know us about for is the main distribution, which you know, started in 2005 from the OpenSUSE perspective with SUSE Linux 10.0. To stop the confusion of having SUSE Linux Enterprise and SUSE Linux, it was renamed to OpenSUSE a year or two later. And for a very long time, the OpenSUSE project was very happy doing traditional community-style distribution releases sort of along the same line of how Debian, Fedora, Ubuntu sort of all work. Um, you know, OpenSUSE 13.2 was released at the end of, of 2014. It was our 14th release, and you know, was in a very healthy, very healthy state. 7,000 packages, and you know, statistics like our, our download numbers were, you know, relatively good, healthy, increasing. Uh, we had, you know, obviously certain areas were, you know, not of quite such interest, such as 32-bit Intel, <coughs> and things like live CDs, which were kind of down at the bottom where very few people were using them. But as a whole, the project was in a very good, healthy, growing state. Um, besides that nasty hiccup at 12.2, which I don't like to talk about. But looking at it as sort of a, a broader context, this sort of organic growth of, you know, from a single distribution project to this large umbrella uh, started becoming a bit of a muddle. We ended up sort of, you know, before 2014, effectively being a community project that consisted four different operating systems. We had you know, OpenSUSE Factory, which was our sort of development code base where all of our developers were meant to be running it, but very few did actually run it because the damn thing was always broken all the time. We had the initial version of Tumbleweed, which was partially rolling, so taking a stable OpenSUSE base and running other stuff on top of that, which was slightly more stable, but in fact, every time you know those two things mismatched, it just broke again. So we had a sort of a very tricky time with things. The main regular release, which also had a bit of a hard time because we were constantly having to figure out where the perfect release schedule was. Was it eight months? Was it twelve months? Moving that around, and we had OpenSUSE Evergreen, which was a community-based effort to have a, an LTS, a longer-supported version of uh, yeah of OpenSUSE of the of the main distribution. And, and this was taking a, an awful lot of, of effort of the community. The community was growing and, and, and great, but we were, you know this sort of lack of focus and, and lack of attention was causing a bit, causing a fair bit of confusion and making it very hard to sort of reach out to new people and explain you know, what is OpenSUSE about, why are we here, why are we doing things. And so it, yeah, at the end of 2014, the project as a whole and the, the board in particular decided to sort of spend a bit of time, 
you know, reflecting, why are we actually, why is OpenSUSE actually doing this? What, what is it there for? What it's, what's its purpose internally as itself? Who should be using OpenSUSE? What is the target audience? Who should contribute to OpenSUSE? Why should they contribute? You know, where, where you know, what is the point of this whole thing? And what makes OpenSUSE special? <coughs> now, when we started looking at this, of course, we started where, you know, with the project tagline, which of course is, the OpenSUSE project promotes, you know, the use of Linux everywhere, targeting everything for everybody. Um, well, anybody who works in marketing will say that, you know, targeting everybody everywhere means you're really targeting nobody nowhere because, you know, that's way too much effort. And that's kind of summed up where the problems were with you know, great aspirations, huge goals, but way too big to really ever quantify. And then everything starts getting muddled at that point. So we started looking at actually, okay, We've been doing this at this time for nine years. Let's forget, you know, well, not forget, but let's, you know, not just think in these grand terms. Let's actually look at where we are succeeding. Where are OpenSUSE's areas of strength? Where does the project have, you know, where is it doing interesting things? Where does it appeal to, to you know, to key areas? You know, what's our good things about it? And the project came together with this, this sort of stack of the parts of OpenSUSE that, you know, definitely are key strength areas for the project. Parts like the tools, YAST, the build service, OpenQA, the huge package selection, which of course we inherit from having OBS in there. And then of course the distributions themselves, so the main distribution or the idea of a rolling release, which we had in Tumbleweed and the regular release. So starting with the tools, this is a quote from a Scottish philosopher, but it really kind of sums up actually how open SUSE thinks and also quite how an awful lot of SUSE R&D thinks. Of, you know, the project is a very tool orientated project. One thing that's, you know, we've been doing for 10 years now, a problem comes up for whatever reason, some issue arises or there's some sort of process issue. And the first thing every developer wants to do is write a new tool to make that problem go away, which sometimes is a great thing and sometimes is not the right way of solving that problem. but We've always been a very tool oriented community. And you see that with the offerings that the OpenSUSE project has, such as the first tool that was written under the OpenSUSE umbrella from pretty much day one, which was the OpenSUSE build service, which is how OpenSUSE builds all of its packages. It's also how SUSE builds all of its packages. And it's a, a completely open platform for developing packages on a whole range of other distributions outside of our, our own ecosystem, such as, such as Fedora and Red Hat, such as Ubuntu and Debian packages, Arch, etc. And, you know, it's been a great success. Obviously, we're still using it. So is OwnCloud, the Linux Foundation, VideoLAN, Dell, Cray, more. So it's, you know. Building's part of the fun, of course. I also work in QA, so I have to mention my, my second love, which is OpenQA, our te testing tool, which again kind of reflects this sort of open SUSE ethos of coming up with an innovative way of dealing with a problem, you know, a, quite a complex technical problem of, you know, okay, we've built this wonderful complex distribution. How do we now make sure it works? And the OpenQA testing tool can test the entire distribution end to end from a user's perspective. You know, does it boot? Does it work? Do the applications work on it? And this started initially sort of as an internal open SUSE project and really evolved over time. Um, going back to the, the four distributions of earlier, um, you know, it started, started with factory and, and then you know, as things evolved, it, it's sort of fingerprints have got all over the project in various places. And now also beyond the project because SUSE is now using it as well for testing the SUSE Linux Enterprise suite of, of products. And yes, it's even been adopted by Red Hat who are using it for testing Fedora. So, it's spreading all over the place. So looking at these tools, looking at the packages, looking at the distributions that the OpenSUSE was offering, we started then sort of trying to map that to the, the typical target audiences where we thought we had some resonance and some strengths and some, some appeal. So, and at the time, a lot of people thought of OpenSUSE as a desktop distribution project, you know, sort of, you know, the open sled perhaps. And, it's true. We do appeal to, des to desktop users, especially you know on the kind of package side of things. But that tool part in particular, the, the jewel in the crown, the bit at the top, has absolutely no relevance whatsoever. Desktop users do not care that we have OBS, that we have OpenQA. They just want the thing to work, and it brings nothing to the table whatsoever. 
Um, and that, that, this is when we started to realize, okay, we're onto something here, because we've been fighting for this desktop motion market for the whole time, and yeah, our coolest things have absolutely nothing for them at all. So we started looking at other audiences of, you know, where, you know, where, where might this work? And also just talking to our existing community, which kept on growing, as you saw in the graph, everything was going pretty smooth in terms of user adoption. So talking to a lot of our users, like, okay, what do you do? Why are you using OpenSUSE? And we realized a lot of them came from the sysapp inside of things. And on the sysapp inside of things, obviously that also included a lot of SUSE customers. Mm -hmm. There was overlap on things like the package, you know, uses of packages, the fact they were appealed, that OpenSUSE had everything that they wanted to play with and use, and they were using the regular releases. Typically, they weren't that interested in something like Tumbleweed or Factory, but the tools were of great interest to them. They were either using OBS or very, very glad that it was there you know, to be used. They could use it to look into the package and understand how the thing worked. Same with OpenQA, and obviously the tools like Yast, Kiwi, Snapper, all had a part to play in, in you know, sysadmins being really appealed to the OpenSUSE project and the distribution. And then, of course, the other audience that we really realized we had very strong resonance with was developers because there OpenSUSE had absolutely something in sort of every every single box linking link, link to that. You know, they were going to be building their packages in OBS. They wanted to make sure they're tested in OpenQA. Of course, they're developers. They'd be, they're the ones adding those packages to give us the broader variety in the first place. And they're also, in some cases, the most demanding user base for that. They want to have all these libraries and all these IDEs and all these tools just so they can get their job done. So they're the ones contributing to the packages and the, some of the heaviest contributors, to, uh, the consumers of it. And of course, the regular release for running their stuff in sort of production environments, or at least, let's say, dev test environments. But tr you know, with the way upstream projects are moving in particular, Tumbleweed was really resonating with them, the idea of having a rolling release where they could keep closer to these upstreams and work with them you know, more often. So realizing this, of course, the people aren't binary. These aren't you know, nice, simple buckets. You know, what is a developer? What is a sysadmin? Um, but we realized that sort of OpenSUSE's sort of core areas of, of appeal and, and, and interest are, are really you know, dealing with Venn diagrams. Developers and all of these overlaps of, of technical de desktop users, technical sys sysadmins, <coughs> you know, developer-oriented sysadmins, DevOps, you know, all these kind of con areas where you've got highly technically skilled people wanting to use Linux to get a job done, to build something, often to build something with it, that is the typical OpenSUSE user. That's where it appeals, where it works. And from this point on, sort of the penny dropped. The project we kind of really realized, okay, this is actually who we are. This is where we appeal to. And so since 2014, OpenSUSE has been w w working much harder to sort of present itself as this, as the, the maker's choice for sort of sysadmins, developers, technical Linux users who want to use a community-based distribution or set of distribution and tools to get a job done. So talking about Tumbleweed, I've been mentioning it already in passing as I've been going through, and you know I've got to sort of start with the lead on this, is rolling releases, in my opinion, are the future of Linux distributions. Right now, we're you know, at a crossing point. We're doing lots of stuff with stable distributions. You know, Sleet 12 is really exciting. Leap is really exciting. But I honestly believe five, six years from now, everything should be rolling. Because it's the only way of actually keeping up with uh, upstream distributions. Um, but you know, it takes a, bit, takes a bit of time to get there. But Tumbleweed is sort of already on that path, figuring out you know, the problems with that. So does everybody know what a concept of a rolling release is? No, I'm seeing some confused faces, which is good because I have a slide for that. So the whole idea of a rolling release is it's, an it's a distribution, it's an operating system without a release schedule. You don't have point revisions. You're not talking about Tumbleweed 12.1 or 12 service pack one. It is just Tumbleweed. It is a single distribution which is constantly changing. So frequent updates to whole packages in the entire stack, the kernel and the, and the, like, the whole thing. Of course, uh, you know, in the case of a, a regular release, you have a nice, easy cadence. You know what you're going to do, when you're going to do it. You, you know, so you know, the updates are there for the deadline. You know, you, you're only going to make changes that can fit in with your, you know, your goals for your deadline and your product delivery. Well, Tumbleweed doesn't have that. Rolling releases don't have that. So updates are delivered when they're ready. And that definition of when they're ready 
is often where the distinction between different rolling releases gets really interesting and where tumbleweed is really different from the other rolling releases out there in the Linux world. Um, because, for example, there's distributions like Arch, where when they're ready is quite often an arbitrary definition of when upstream thinks they might be ready. Um, Gentoo, when they're ready, is defined by when it's compiled on your machine. And in Tumbleweed, when you're ready is actually when we've tested it, which is the interesting side of things. And the main benefit of using a rolling release, it's really all about getting the latest of everything you're interested in. Getting the latest upstream applications from projects like GNOME, KDE, from YAST, able to actually use it, consume it, play with it, tinker it. You know, if you're going to be contributing to it, you're going to be working on the stuff that's been produced by them. And of course, that also means things like the base package. You know, kernel developers are almost all using rolling releases. They have to. It's the only way they can actually see what they're doing. Because the kernel is moving so quickly these days, you can't just rely on putting it on a nice stable distribution and hope it's going to fit in with everything else that's going on in the world. And of course, that also means, because you know, obviously those kind of demanding <coughs> de uh, developer environments are running rolling releases, it's the place where you're going to get the best experience doing things like latest development tools with GCC, with Go, with Docker. Because they're all moving very, very quickly. All of these paths are moving fast. And that's why people want to use rolling releases. But our rolling release, Open a Tumbleweed, didn't actually start as a proper rolling release. Um, it started from Greg Crow Hartman, the Linux kernel developer. And he had a very particular problem he wanted to fix for himself. OpenSUSE had Factory at the time, which was a rolling release, but with no testing, and therefore it was broken all the time. So he wanted to take a stable release that worked, which was the traditional OpenSUSE distribution at the time, and have the bits on top that he cared about rolling, which was basically the kernel and his choice of desktop environment and Emacs, and yeah, that was it initially. It grew from there with community helping. But the problem that that had was it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't a proper rolling release, and you had a whole lot of issues with, with integration that I'll go about in a minute. Um, so, it, yeah, it got very sticky and very problematic. In parallel, we started realizing that, you know, to, use, to do factory properly, we had to start testing it. And so we started using OpenQA, testing the factory code base very, very heavily. And what we, well, for a very brief period of time, we ended up in a quirky situation where we, in essence, had two different rolling releases. We had Tumbleweed and we had Factory, and they were both great-ish, um, but we were wasting a huge amount of effort doing everything in parallel. And so in November 2014, we merged the two together, and well, in essence, we actually killed off the old Greg KH Tumbleweed, but kept the name and renamed Factory. Um, with, with testing, and that's become the new Tumbleweed since 2014. So if you're an old Tumbleweed user and you went away because it was broken, since then it's not been nearly as broken. And it's tested continuously by OpenQA, and when it comes to sort of the, the key focus areas, who we expect to be using it, that's where every single OpenSUSE developer pretty much is using it, and it really appeals to that kind of enthusiast focus, especially upstream contributor, upstream enthusiast focus, you know, wanting a, a distribution that's reliable, it works, but is constantly moving in pace of where all these upstreams are. So, like I say, we merged the two together. But, like I said, when, when, before we started this merger, like I say, we had this interesting issue with the old tumbleweed of, it was a nice stable base, but with stuff moving on top. And in theory, it works very, very well. Um, it's got a lot in common with how SUSE do a module with you know, sleep solid base and a module moving on top. But a module has a benefit of actually being a, a, a sort of a single, well-defined, very narrowly defined software stack that makes sense for that one specific use case for those specific customers using SLE. With Tumbleweed, didn't have, we didn't have that definition. And we ended up hitting what I kind of now call the rolling release paradox of if you want to be able to be able to move anything across a big complicated software stack like OpenSUSE is, 8,000, 9,000 packages, you have to be able to be prepared to move everything, the entire distribution, the whole GC, glibc, the whole stack, the whole kernel. You have to be able to find a way of doing all of that integration work at a ridiculously fast pace because you don't want to you know, stop for six months to integrate all of that. And that w figuring that out was what really unlocked rolling releases for Tumbleweed and doing it properly. Being able to move the whole thing faster and faster and faster. 
And also, it's something that we now see, in some respects, actually being adopted in the mindset of how we develop sleep. Obviously, we don't change everything all the time. That would be crazy. But when it comes to what goes into a service pack, for example, it's, the, it's those large service packs where we have the room to slightly shift some of this stuff around that we you know, are more ambitious about what features we put inside SLE. Otherwise, we do keep it very conservative. We don't move everything. Sometimes we do say on SLE that we can't do that because we can't afford to shift everything underneath that, that SLE code base. But with Tumbleweed, we had, you know, we had all the tools. OBS is there to build lots of packages all the time on a constantly moving surface. If it needs to rebuild something, OBS knows how to rebuild everything in a dependency chain. OpenQA was there for testing it, and there we had Tumbleweed. So every Tumbleweed now is being used by approximately 60,000 users. And we get uh, a regular mail from uh, one of our Tumbleweed maintainers of, you know, what happened in Tumbleweed this week? How many updates and stuff like that? And a couple of months ago, he said, yeah, we had a really quiet week this week. And uh, the funny thing is, I then actually looked at what actually changed in the distribution that week. And a quiet week for Tumbleweed is actually three snapshots. Now, a Tumbleweed snapshot is the equivalent of a SLE 12 service pack. It's a new ISO. It's a new set of repositories. It's a new set of ISOs, in fact. And in this case, three snapshots actually consisted of 146 package updates. That's, you know, that's a quiet week now for <coughs> OpenSUSE. Um, and one, that included a whole new kernel as well in that week. So um, yeah, if, if that's quiet, what the heck is a busy week? Um, so I looked at it a few months later. Actually, this was about a month ago. This is actually more like a typical tumbleweed week now five snapshot releases, whole new distribution, all new ISOs, all new repositories, 300 plus packages. It's just getting faster and faster and faster. And we now start thinking it's quiet if two new kernels is what we're doing in a week in OpenSUSE. It's just getting quicker and quicker and quicker. The process is working very, very well. And it means that we can work with upstream projects in a way we never were able to before. I, the example I often bring up is, is GNOME, where six months ago, uh, GNOME 320 was released, and we able to, were able to get that from the upstream release in Tumbleweed in less than a week. GNOME 322 came out a few months ago. It was there in 26 hours because we were able to work with the upstream uh, straight away, make sure it works, get it built, get it tested, get it pushed through in the hands of users, and the world didn't, didn't, didn't work. Yes? So you say by if other users contribute to Tumbleweed, also yes, accelerate it exactly. And smoothen out, um, yeah, smoothen out those problems. Yes, and therefore make it even faster to be able to Yes, and we're, we're seeing that with like the KDE side of things as well, and the kernel and all that. So, um, this graph is unfortunately a little bit out of date now, but it's uh, the only one I have, um, which shows sort of the historical bit. So, the orange line is old tumbleweed, which was in a sort of a permanent state of decline at the before we started shifting stuff. The blue line was factory, so um, always had a very low number of users, of, you know, about 2,000-ish. Um, but then we started testing it, we started pushing it more and more of a rolling release, and as you see, the users were climbing. And then November 2014, we decided, okay, let's merge this, one distribution, one rolling release, and since then, it's skyrocketed. The amount of users we have is just going crazy. This is 2, uh, 24,000. We looked again in uh, June this year, it was 60,000. I have no idea where it is right now. But yeah, always changing, always working, which has kind of become the, the tumbleweed motto of things. But what does this have to do with SLE? Well, I need to kind of cover how OpenSUSE and SUSE Linux Enterprise used to work. So in the, back in the past, way back when OpenSUSE started, the traditional model, as was sort of conceptualized when OpenSUSE was, was born, was to have the OpenSUSE factory development platform be where most of the development was done initially. OpenSUSE would then do its regular community distributions on its six or 12 months cadence, so 11.1, 11.2, et cetera. And then when there was a major SLE release required, that would be effectively branched off from the most relevant OpenSUSE release at the time. That would then become, for example, SLE 11, and then SLE 11 service packs would move on at their own pace after that. 
This is a little bit of an unfair diagram because, of course, each SLE 12, each SLE 11 service pack it always used a little bit of stuff from OpenSUSE, but it generally kind of covers the, you know, the sort of, I guess, the the hard code reality. You know, that this these these were developed as sort of very separate things, moving along as they did year in year out. And SLE 12 initially had the same plan. You know, so 3.12, the original concept was to have it based on OpenSUSE 13.2. But at the same time, SUSE was look, thinking and talking a lot internally about the gap, this, this kind of concept that OpenSUSE you know, did a great job reaching out to developers and enthusiasts you know, and wondering, you know, doing a very fine job there. And of course, SLE dealing with big ISVs, big money, big customers, and even small ISVs as well, but, you know, enterprise users. And there was this huge sort of technical and innovation gap between the two where, you know, what OpenSUSE was doing wasn't necessarily that relevant with what the enterprise was wanting. And also vice versa, what the enterprise was doing wasn't necessarily that useful to what OpenSUSE was. So whenever it came to doing a new major release, especially inside SUSE R&D, there was this you know, long, complicated catch-up job of figuring out, okay, how do, you know, how do you get all your engineers caught up on four years of upstream development and then start tuning from that point to what your customers actually need? And you know, that, that is a, you know, was a huge investment. It was a, you know, we could see that being a huge pain point during SP2, SD12 development before we even got there. And we realized inside SUSE that you know, in closing the gap would have mutual benefits in both directions. You know, obviously, it would make it easier for SUSE to take upstream innovation and start m m uh, mixing it into the SLEE product family. And also, OpenSUSE would benefit from actually having more developers with SUSE working on OpenSUSE stuff and having a, you know, a completely different tier of, of polish and tune to the OpenSUSE code base and, and the packages within it. So, Looking at this sort of, yeah, the river flowing downstream, the traditional concept of OpenSUSE being upstream of SLE, you know, we've always had this concept of, of taking a, a community innovation from OpenSUSE, SUSE engineering working on it, and then it up becoming an enterprise feature inside the SLE family of things. And that's what SLE 12 was doing. That was the plan. That was, you know, SLE 12, 13, two, you know, taking it from OpenSUSE 13, two. But that's a lie. That isn't how it happened at all. Because despite all of this, in some respects, OpenSUSE 13.2, because it hadn't been aligned, because the community had gone in its own direction in some places, in some cases it was too far ahead of where we wanted for SLEE, and in other cases it was actually too far behind what we wanted for SLEE. And you know, we, yeah, OpenSUSE had been a little bit too conservative, which was kind of fun. So the only option SUSE had was pulling stuff straight from Tumbleweed. By this point, Open Factory had been renamed to Tumbleweed. So, you know, pulling stuff direct from the rolling release, things like some of the BTRFS features, some of the features in Snapper, some parts of Yast, a surprising amount actually, came straight from Tumbleweed into the SLE 12 code base as part of the SLE 12 development process. Now, of course, doing that, you know, there was, you know, some worries about risk, but at the same time, there was also, uh, concerns of, of you know making sure that that SUSE wasn't you know doing something that would then hurt itself in the long run you know we don't want to diverge and, and start causing this problem all over again so SLE 13 would have the same issue so at the same time SUSE implemented a, a tumbleweed first policy of every developer doing anything on SLE 12 had to make sure what they were doing was already in tumbleweed first so it was working in both directions where you know those few select things that weren't in OpenSUSE, you know, weren't in the OpenSUSE release, could be pulled straight from Tumbleweed, and the things that you know everything else that SUSE was doing directly on SLE going back into Tumbleweed, ready there, so we're not worrying about having to do this catch up again for for SLE 13. And sort of the main lesson that, that SUSE learned from that is taking code from OpenSUSE wasn't actually nearly as scary as we thought it was going to be. It worked. <coughs> It worked surprisingly well. It, you know, they just it didn't break really that much. But then also contributing that SLE code back really helped OpenSUSE. OpenSUSE, you know, got a huge amount of polish that it, you know, hadn't been getting for that long period between SLE 11 and SLE 12. 
and SUSE's engineers were much more aware of what had been going on in upstream, changes to system D, changes to the kernel, changes to key libraries. They may not necessarily be adopting them in SLE, but they were aware of what was going on, having these conversations with, with OpenSUSE and upstream developers and you know, talking on the same terms and not spending a long time catching up so they can then have these conversations. And of course, investing in the future. So when SLE 13 comes around, we know the stuff that SUSE cares about is already in OpenSUSE. So we're not having to put it back in again four years, you know, a few years from now. And this already at this point had this kind of you know, never ending cyclic effect we could already see of you know, the contributions were going into OpenSUSE. That made it easy to then pull stuff from OpenSUSE into SLE, which made it easy to put more stuff back into OpenSUSE, repeat at you know, repeat forever. It, you know, it was getting a snowball effect at that point, which was great because at the same time, OpenSUSE was you know, still going through this kind of review process of you know, which direction were they going in. And one of the biggest problems OpenSUSE always had was this feeling of being pulled in two different directions, of a big chunk of the community wanting everything faster and a big chunk of the community wanting everything more slow, more stable. That's one of the reasons why the OpenSUSE project kept on changing its release schedule to kind of make everybody happy. But by this point, OpenSUSE had tumbleweed. So really, the desperate call was we needed a stable OpenSUSE, a more stable OpenSUSE than the old-fashioned release. And so OpenSUSE was discussing among itself of you know, what makes the perfect stable OpenSUSE distribution. You know, what, what, did, what did everybody want? What was the wish list? Which actually wasn't that terrifying a wish list. You know, obviously, stable, being well-maintained, having all the packages with somebody looking at them, getting security updates in it, working properly. In an ideal world, we wanted an enterprise-grade base system, you know, something along the line of CentOS, with a with a comparable life cycle. So, you know, something like three years or more, which really compares well to how you know Ubuntu and, and other community distributions work out there. We didn't want to sacrifice the wide selection of packages that OpenSUSE you know has in there, which you know was one of the risks. Most of these kind of very long-term releases have very short package selections. And in some cases, the base system is what everybody cares about. They wanted to make sure it has a nice solid kernel and you know, the core libraries are all nice and stable. But you often have users who want you know, the latest version of, of their desktop environment of choice sitting on top. So you know, a slightly faster moving user space experience. And this is where the concept which we now know as OpenSUSE Leap really came from. Um, so that sort of the initial starting point was SUSE taking all of the SLE sources including the SLE sources for maintenance updates, for patches, and proactively making them available in the public OpenSUSE build service. It started doing this at the, in the beginning of last year. Now, when we announced this, the first thing that everybody asked is, cool, so SUSE is doing CentOS. And yeah, no, um, <laughs> definitely no. Um, for starters, this is done in a different way than CentOS. It is the sources being made available, not the binaries. This is not a case of, you know, the SLE binaries are out in the wild for everybody to download. The sources are there for the OpenSUSE project to use and build from. Now, of course, that does mean somebody could if they wanted to, but at the same time, if you look at what Open, the OpenSUSE project was interested in, it wanted something different. It was looking for something that was actually more akin to closing that gap of taking the enterprise stuff and building something different on top of it, a best of both worlds distribution, a hybrid distribution that takes community stuff and the SLE products, and then makes a, a sort of comprehensive hybrid distribution on it. Yes? It includes most of the extensions, yes. Um, I think it could include all of them, but things like real time. Can, hmm? No? <coughs> Um, okay, HA and Geo isn't technically part of it, but if you go, if I fly back to this slide over here, it's a kind of a null and void point because the HA and Geo stuff ends up in tumbleweed anyway. So yes, <laughs> but yeah, so it's you know comes from that approach of doing things. So yes and no. Yeah. And the, you know, the, uh, the other products built around, so all of the uh, old stack-based products. Yeah. Are all of those pushed into 
Not, 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 not all of, not all of this. So, so I'm talking mainly about the the key SLE code base. So that's SLES, SLED, um, yeah, and mo most of those extensions. Because in, inside SUSE, those are actually built as inside one big build service project, and then carved up as the product, the products that we then ship. So it, it's sort of taking that kind of core code base part, the common code base, which I go into a little more detail in a bit here, and then you know move on from that. So. Hopefully I'll explain it. If not, you can ask me more questions in a minute. So yeah, like I said, you know, OpenSUSE was fighting for something more stable, and Leap was really there to sort of plug the gap as the sort of stable complement to the OpenSUSE project. You know, the sort of, in some respects polar opposite of Tumbleweed, because it's coming with two different code bases inside. You know, the Leap code base, the SLE code base, and the OpenSUSE code base. And the way the, the distribution kind of works, this is the, the graph from Leap 42.1, so the first release of Leap. The, the family looks something like this, where the, share core, the shared core was you know, just a, uh, about more like 75% of the SLE code base. So kernel, core libraries, core systems, you know, that SLE is built on top of, was made available and actively used by OpenSUSE. In some cases, the community didn't take all that was available to them. So in the case of 42.1, the kernel that was in SLE 12 SP1 at the time was a little bit too old for the community's interest, didn't have enough hardware support and, and, and the like for that. So that's why this yeah, leap column in the middle, the community part is a little bit longer because it included actually a community kernel in there to replace the SLE one. That's not exactly what we wanted, but you know, the community, we, that's you know, how the things worked out. Um, with 42.2, the release that's coming in the future, the, uh, the parity is actually way a lot, an awful lot higher. It's pretty much all of SLE 12 SP2 without, I think, any major part actually replaced. GNOME's the same, system D's the same, kernel's the same. So yeah, it's, you know, we, we've learned from this. We did it the first time and you know, moved the line around. But yeah, the community stuff is then built on top of that. So 6,000 packages from the community. And Tumbleweed, which at the time of writing this slide was 8,000 packages, but it's actually over 10,000 now, which is a completely sort of separate code base as a rolling release. But of course, they're all built on OBS, therefore all easy for us to port things across and you know, share code and swap, swap and share code across the whole thing. So just like we planned, SLE, was now offering a stable code base to the, the OpenSUSE project? Yes? Could you explain a little bit about memory Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so when it came to, yeah, so OpenSUSE decided to build this distribution called Leap. Um, and we were basing it on SLE sources. At this point, SLE was at SLE 12 SP1. Then we had the problem of, okay, what do we do as a numbering system for OpenSUSE Leap? Because on one side of things, it was the successor to 13.2. So we couldn't call it 12.1. We really couldn't call it 12.1 when OpenSUSE had already had 12.1. But we wanted to have a clear, distinct relationship between the SLE version numbers, 12 service pack one, and the OpenSUSE version numbers, because they were gonna be following the same kind of pattern of having minor releases every year, and a major release when there's a code base change. So we had a long discussion in the community, a really long discussion, um, and several proposals, um, including one of just starting at one and moving up from there. Um, but I made a joke, <laughs> um, a joke based with some history. So uh, the original version of SLE, uh, sorry, the original version of SUSE Linux was version 4.2, a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy references 42. Um, it's also the version number for the first version of Yast, not .42. So I was like, why not call this 42? Um, and yeah, it started as a joke. We then realized that 42 is 12 plus 30. So it kind of started working. And then we realized, so if we call this 42.1, this is based on SLE 12 SP1, you know, there's the relationship. So that was the idea. I then decided at this point, well, I sobered up and realized this wasn't a nice idea but everybody outvoted me, so it stuck. And yes, it's now 42.1 and I have to live with my bad ideas forever. Um, <laughs> so yeah, 42.1, just subtract 30, that's the SLE version it's based on. 42.2 is based on SLE 12 SP2. When there's SLE 13, it'll be 43. So, so 
So is, is the leak uh, scheme, is that replacing the 13 by 2 Yes. Scheme? Yes. Going forward, it's going forward, there is no longer a traditional open source release. Mm -hmm. It's now totally replaced by Leap for the conservative end of things and Tumbleweed for the, the fast moving rolling side of things. So, so is 42.1 ahead of 13.2? Yes, in almost every case. And in case of 42.2, in every case. There was a, because of the mix and matching of how C12 was built, there was a few bits and pieces where stuff shifted around a bit. But now we're working much closer together. It's been really easy for us to move things around. And that's, that's actually a good segue, actually. It's, it's part of the thing that we've really seen from this is, you know, SUSE has been incredibly helpful in accommodating to OpenSUSE to do changes in SLE to make things a little bit easier for OpenSUSE of, of, you know, so you know, it might not have been done, you know, typically because, you know, no customer is asking for it. But if we do this, then, oh, that enables some, you know, it fixes things like version numbering matches in OpenSUSE. So we did it in SLEE that way, which has been, you know, a really nice thing to see and quite often sort of slipped in side benefits that, you know, just pushing things along, which is the point of the whole thing. So that's actually what this slide was been, you know, going about because OpenSUSE has got its stable code base. SUSE has an easier way of taking upstream innovation from the OpenSUSE project. And we are all talking much more happier to each other and you know, much more regularly, much more involvement. SUSE, you know, it's very hard, well, I get it. As you notice, my pronouns have been flying all over the place during this. You know, I, the OpenSUSE, SUSE distinction is nowhere near as defined as it used to be. We are all OpenSUSE. And SUSE is, you know, OpenSUSE is a big part of SUSE now. That's, that was the whole point of this. So going forward, when it comes to things like, uh, yeah, release schedules, this is my best effort to try and explain how it all works going forward, um, which yeah, kind of, kind of explains everything. So we have the core, so 12.1, which was the core for SLE 12 SP1, and Leap 42.1. Some things from Leap 42.1 were derived from Tumbleweed, not everything. You know, we don't necessarily update everything on the community stack every time. You know, we're doing a stable release. We, know, we don't want to you know, risk breaking everything all the time, but we can, we do, we do pull it down. Now with SLE 12 SP2 being released this week, there was the new core 12 SP2, and that was actually developed in the open, in parallel with OpenSUSE. So OpenSUSE were, de were developing Leap 42.2 with its alphas and betas, while SLE were developing SP2 with its alphas and betas and release candidates. And that weird crooked arrow on the left there uh, was, well, when I wrote this conceptual, but actually proved to be true. Some features in, in, the, in, the, in the base system, in the core, came from the, the leap version from the year before. You know, it was able to go and leap from the community side of things, then, you know, looking at SLE you know, requirements for SLE service packs. Let's put this in service pack two. It's an awful lot easier to do that. It's already been based on SLE. We know it works on SLE. And you know, those kind of adopt, uh, innovations and adoptions have been very easy to then slip into that service pack. So when I get to the end and show what is in 42.2, you'll realize there's an awful lot of commonality between SLE 12 SP2 and Leap 42.2. And this is the plan again for 42.3 with service pack three, which development has already started on. And the interesting thing, and this is where SLE and OpenSUSE will, will likely diverge uh, slightly, but still being aligned, luckily, um, is the next major release. So obviously, the next major release of SLE 13 is coming, you know, not that far away, in fact. And from that point on, OpenSUSE will stop tracking SLE 12. You know, there's no real interest or impetus from the community to, you know, stick with SLE 12 for the kind of, you know, long 15 years, 13 plus years that uh, SLE 12 is, is going for. So when SLE 13 development starts or Leap 43 development starts, the next Leap release after that will be based on that SLE 13 code base. And you know, obviously SUSE will continue doing SLE 12 service packs, but OpenSUSE will not be tracking them. There will not be Leap versions for that. So the OpenSUSE community will have to worry about you know, one code base, not the two that SUSE is worrying about. And the plan for the plan for that, when development kicks off, which will, will be actually taking everything from Tumbleweed as it stands today, because the old approach of taking from an OpenSUSE stable distribution doesn't work anymore. 
it would be you know some, somewhat cyclic it would be basing itself on itself it just doesn't work so tumbleweed is stable enough tumbleweed is what's fast moving where all the upstream innovation is so sleeve 13 development will start with a frozen version of tumbleweed Obviously, we will need to spend an awful lot of time getting that you know, enterprise polished and ready, so that will then be, become the, the beginnings of Code 13. And then Code 13 will have Sleep 13 and Leap 43 built on top of that. Yes? Um, are, are Tumbleweed and Leap available on all uh, Tumble, uh, tum uh, yeah. T at the moment, Leap is available on... 64-bit Intel mainly, with community-supported ports for Power and ARCH64. There is efforts to do an S390 port for Leap. Um, the problems there are mainly uh, mainframe power for the OpenSUSE project. So if you have a spare mainframe and you're willing to donate it, we really, really would like it. Um, <laughs> yeah, but that's, yeah, that's the, the blocker there for that. Um, tumbleweed, pretty much the same, but Tumbleweed also has an, a 32-bit Intel support. So in fact, that supports an architecture that SLE doesn't support. Did you mention ARM? Uh, I mentioned ARCH64, so yeah, ARM. So 64-bit ARM. Um, there are also some, uh, some architecture-specific ARM images for things like ARMv7, ARMv6 with Tumbleweed. And because of the... Uh, Slee for Raspberry Pi announcement. Um, we already have tumbleweed images for Raspberry Pi, and the leap images. Well, we started building them right after that announcement, so hopefully they should be ready soon. Um, in fact, the ARM booth has it running already, but yeah, needs a bit of testing. So it's yeah, this is what it's all, all working together. So pretty much, but yeah, unfortunately, OpenSUSE hasn't got a mainframe besides what what little little spare capacity SUSE can afford to give us, which isn't much really. Um, yeah, so that's yeah, that's the plan for Sleep 13, and of course, from that point of things, Leap 43.0 and onwards will follow that same model of you know tracking the service packs, having an open SUSE point release alongside every Sleep service pack. And so, from that point of view, the community, you know, I think I, I you know, it's been a year now since 42.1's release. I think we've ticked all these boxes. We have a stable release. It is well maintained. It does have an enterprise base system. And, you know, the life cycle, it's, you know, we haven't quite figured out when the life cycle ends because we don't know quite when Sleep 13 is going to be. And we don't quite know how much overlap we will have for the support of the last 42 base release and the, you know, the, the next uh, Sleep 13. We're still discussing that. Um, but it's all pretty much there. We know it's going to be at least three years. So that's exactly what we wanted. And so Leap 42.2, which is the next release based on Sleep 12 SP2. Um, has pretty much the same as Sleep 12 SP, Sleep 12 SP2, the same kernel, so 4.4 LTS, with the same config this time. So this is an improvement from 42.1, where OpenSUSE diverged. This time, the kernel, the kernel fits both what the OpenSUSE community wants and what the Sleep product expects. Same systemd with 228, the same GNOME, which of course is the which is another great success story. In fact, where uh, the the GNOME upgrade for the GNOME upgrade for SLE was done so sort of simultaneously in Tumbleweed and Leap and SLE and you know by everybody all in one go and you know just kind of proves that we can do everything all together. Uh, obviously, SLE does not have KDE, but Leap does. So we have uh, KDE Plasma 5.8, which is KDE's first ever LTS release. Um, by doing Leap 42.1, we were able to start this discussion with the KDE project about you know hey, it'd be really nice if there was KDE versions that had a little bit longer life cycle that you know, ideally maybe something aligned with what we're doing. Um, and they were really receptive to that. And in fact, what, what ended up happening was they agreed in principle, but then we looked at their, you know, our shared calendars between it and the, the KDE release schedule was a little bit late from what we wanted to get it in here. And ours was a little bit early, depending on how you look at it, I guess. So they actually pulled their release earlier. We slightly delayed the release of Leap gave us a nice chunky couple of months to get everything integrated together. So this is why OpenSUSE Leap is being released on the 16th of November, because we had to spend that time getting KDE in there properly. But if you want to download it today, the release candidate, or basically the gold master, is available on that URL. And um, we've been demo at the booth. It's been well, you know, working really well. The beta feedback's been great. And uh, I can think of at least one case of an OpenSUSE 
leap tester finding a bug that I missed in QA for SLE, which was incredibly embarrassing, but um, good in the point of view of SLE got better because of it. So going back to the sort of the, yeah, the question about, you know, what does OpenSUSE have in terms of distributions now? We went from four, we now just have two, and that's a lot easier to talk about. So, you know, Tumbleweed is the rolling release, continuously updated, continuously tested, only shipped when, every, when everything we're testing works, which is, you know, perfect for developers and power users. And then we have Leap, which kind of covers that whole sysadmin, enterprise developers, more conservative developers. If, you, you know, if you're developing for SLE or developing on SLE, you know, Leap's going to have all those tools that you can't get running on SLE, even with the SDK. But at least it's the same SLE system under there, so it should be very easy for you then to port what you need across or you know, start those conversations with SLE product managers about getting it in a module or getting it into Package Hub, which I really wanted to talk about, but there's a presentation about that on Friday, so I didn't want to steal all the thunder. But you know, Package Hub is another example of all of this where you know, it's a SUSE-derived project of having a repository of packages built for SLE with the OpenSUSE community building it on Tumbleweed. So if you'd like to know more about that, please come to the presentation uh, Friday, November. And I think it's in this room. I need to double check the schedule. We might have moved it around, but that's where it was. And with that, thank you very much.